Bob Devaney is one of my, you know, personal all-time favorite people. Um, we're now going to enter into the last era, and that is the Tom Osborne era. And if you want to bring your chair down into here, uh, make sure that you read this sign right here because this kind of sums up Tom Osborne. Oh, this is next. Before I go on any further, um, I'd like to introduce my friend to all of you. This is Dan Wagner. Uh, we've been fans friends for, for a couple years. We met over the internet. And Dan is a longtime collector, one of the most knowledgeable collectors I know. He's going to be helping the museum out on August 4th when we have a courthouse for appraisal day. And uh, uh, Dan is just an example of, of, of of some of us crazy people who like to collect this stuff and so forth. But he has a very extensive collection himself. And we've done a lot of trading. And many, many of the items you see in here, I actually obtained from Dan. And I've sold him some things, and traded some things, and then he's, he's traded some things to me. And a lot of the way we do things is from fellow traders, you know, fellow collectors. And so I, I always like to make friends with, with people who like to find this stuff. Um, I'm going to say uh, something before I, I go on in, in the Osborne era. I made the statement that the most influential uh, person in modern Nebraska football history is Bob Bain, and I believe that. I do not think Tom Osborne could have done the same thing that Bob Devaney did. Bob Devaney did the very thing that needed to be done in the right way. We needed someone mature, we needed someone with wit, we needed someone with humor, and Bob Devaney was, was the right person at the right time in history. At the same time, I don't think Bob Devaney could have ever done what Tom Osborne has done. And, and if I in any way have made a statement that, that you think that, that, that I think Tom Osborne is not a great person, that is totally the wrong attitude. Uh, I do not think the people of Nebraska or college football in general really have digested what Tom Osborne has done. Tom Osborne will always be viewed by most Nebraskans and, and, and people in the college world as the most successful and most amazing coach in Nebraska football history, and I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, in the 25 years that Tom Osborne was head coach, he was nothing but class. Uh, you can look back and say, well, he probably should have won a couple more national titles, and he should have. But for 25 years, he won nine games every year, at least nine games every year. He won his games at a time when college football was very competitive. When I say Jumbo Sign is the most successful coach, he was playing against schools like Drake and Iowa and Morningside. Tom Osborne was playing against Penn State, Alabama, Oklahoma, Auburn, Florida State. What Tom Osborne did, I don't think there'll ever be another coach in the history of Nebraska football that will top what he did. I think we need to have seen a pinnacle. Of, of, of football under, under Tom Osborne. There may be some coaches who will come and maybe win as many national titles, but I don't think there'll ever be a, a person again in Nebraska history that will be able to do it for 25 years and do it with the class that he's done it with and, and, and with the dignity that he's done it with. And another thing that maybe uh, I want to say at this point, uh, I think one of the reasons Nebraska football history uh, is so important to us because to me, when we talk about university, it's not a place where we go and play football. It's a place where we go and educate our children. And really, when you talk about your children, that's the most important thing you have. And to me, it's a place that the people of Nebraska send our children to. That's where, that's the final uh, educational spot for them. And there, we want them to be associated with good people, with good leaders, with good teachers. And some of our players have the talent to go on and play football. And I'm happy for that. I think it's wonderful. Uh, but to me, the real testimony of a good program is not how many players are in the pros. It's how many players have left this program and left this school and have become good citizens. And if you take a close look at the football program, the thing that has always amazed me is that many of the players who play football go on to be very successful people in life. They go on to become doctors, they go on to become lawyers, they go on to become teachers. And, and 
by and large, the people who have played football are very successful people. And to me, that's the real tribute of our program. And we have one of the great programs. We have a very high graduation rate. And for 25 years, Tom Osborne was a, was a coach that everyone could be proud of. He didn't win every game, and he probably lost a couple games that he should have won. And I, like many other fans, cursed him once in a while. But, but Tom Osborne, for 25 years, was one of the great, great men in community college football history. When, when Tom Osborne took over the program in 1973, the program was strong. we come off a couple national titles. And a lot of people don't realize this, but early on, Tom Osborne was asshat. In fact, this is a wonderful piece here of Dave Crum. It was Dave Crum who set all the passing records at Nebraska. And it was Tom Osborne. And during his era, it has all the passing records. A lot of people don't realize that. Another great quarterback to come after him was, was Vince Ferragamo. But early in Tom Osborne's history, he had a problem beating Oklahoma. For five years, he couldn't beat Oklahoma. Finally, in 1978, Oklahoma came into Nebraska, and that was Osborne's first victory over Oklahoma. And we finally had beaten Barry Switzer and Billy Sims and the Oklahoma Sooners. And finally, Nebraska thought in 1978 we would win a national title. But does everybody know what happened after that? The very next week, what happened? Missouri came to town and lost to Missouri. <laughs> so the great, one of the great wins in, in Tom Osborne's early era was followed by one of the most bitter defeats, and that knocked us out of the national title. In A scheduling quirk. <laughs> scheduling yes. quirk. You never played Missouri last for a quarter century, and yeah. the only year. Uh, then, uh, because of, of the early struggles uh, in the 70s, Tom Osborne actually took the I formation and developed an option game from it. And so, as we enter into the 80 era, what you have is you have Tom Osborne changing the whole style of offense and going with a power I option game. And one thing that I think Tom Osborne will become known for as one of the great football minds in college history, because his, you know, Tom Osborne approached the game from a physics standpoint. He would sit and look on the chalkboard and look at the angles of plays, and he approached it with, from such a, an intellect concept. But in, in the early 80s, he started playing option football, and one of the early great option quarterbacks is Turner Gill, and really it was the development of this option that really produced a tremendous program. And once again, as we go into the 80s, let's come on over here. The program was winning many, many games, but it seemed like every year there was one or two losses, and, and it would kind of ruin uh, the chance for a national title. But throughout the 80s, the team was winning, they were going to bowl games, and uh, uh, it was just a tremendous program. Some of the great players of the 1980 would be Steve Taylor and Robert Thomas. Uh, in 1989, Nebraska celebrated its 100th year of Nebraska football, and there's some nice pieces in that display that, that kind of talks about the 100th uh, year of Nebraska football. Then as we go into the 1990s, I want to talk just a little bit about the 1993 team. By then, uh, we had a, uh, a young quarterback a sophomore quarterback by the name of Tommy Frazier. And uh, the 1993 team went undefeated during that entire season. One of the great defensive players was Trev Alberts. And if you all remember, after the 1993 season, we ended up playing Florida State in the Orange Bowl. And that is the game where we beat them statistically. Nebraska played a marvelous game. Uh, but when it was all said and done, Nebraska ended up losing 18-16. And I don't want to sound like I'm a sour person, I'm sour about the game, but I do believe there was some really bad calls in the game. So the officiating was, was not what it should have been. But the thing that is amazing about that game is Osborne had been close so many times, and Garrett was just like on the fingertips, and he once again would let another national title go by. But after that loss, in spring practice and in fall practice, what they did is they put on the scoreboard the score. 18 to 16, and throughout spring ball and throughout fall ball, all the players kept looking at that score. And the players themselves were mad because, you know, they felt that, that they had not finished business. 
And so the 1994 season, the theme of that year was looking for more in 1994. They wanted to finish this. And we all know what happened in 1994. It was a roller coaster of a season because Tommy Frazier had blood clots and he was out part of the time. Then we had a sensational quarterback in Brooke Barrier step up and have a sensational year. One of the great offensive lines played that year, which the offensive line now has become known as the pipeline. And finally, it was in 1994 that Osmond finally won his first national title. And it was long overdue. And uh, to me, that is probably the most emotional game I've ever seen. I mean, it was, I mean, it was hard. <laughs> And, uh, and to think for time, we were going to lose that one too, because we had to go into the fourth quarter, and, and finally, and, and just a <laughs> tremendous comeback, you know, the team won. And to me, that game just kind of lifted a big, big burden of Osborne, even though to him it was never a big thing to have a title. Uh, and Osborne had always said, you know, it's not the game, it's the journey. I mean, it, it, it's the interactive. But that... That championship kind of sparked, I think, maybe a mean spot in Osborne, because after that, I mean, he went on a tear. Then we entered the 1995 season, and we'll come on around here. And in 1995, uh, Nebraska simply lined up and blew everyone off the ball. To me, it's kind of amazing to realize that the 1995 Nebraska football team is considered the best ever college team to ever play the game. By sports writers across the country, the 1995 Nebraska Cornhuskers was considered the best ever team. And guess who was considered the second best team? Oh. No, nope. the 1971 Nebraska football team. Oh. So the two best teams in college football history are the 95 Nebraska Cornhuskers and the 1971 Nebraska Cornhuskers. Now, this is the question for the debate. If those two teams in their prime actually got together, who would win? <laughs> and you know, that would be tough. Jerry Tate, Jeff Kenny, Johnny Rogers, Rich Glover against Tommy Frazier, Christian Peter, Lawrence Phillips when he wasn't on the team, and so forth. They would have been a great team. Something that I have always found interesting is the 1995 season, the theme of that year was staying focused. And if you look at the one person in the center of this poster, it's a big picture of Lawrence Phillips, and you know it's a shame. He's the one person who did not stay focused in 95. And uh, to me, I think the University of Nebraska gives these athletes a tremendous opportunity. And some of them are going to take advantage of it, and some of them are not. And you know, he not only let down his teammates, he let down the fans, but more importantly, he let down himself. And uh, to me, to be able to play for the Cornhuskers is one of the great honors. And, 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 and one of the things that players have said throughout the years is that uh, it was a real honor to play for Nebraska because of the way the fans treat us. If there's two things I'd like you to go back and read, read the little note that Grant Wistrom wrote on, on his uh, uh, autograph picture over there, and go back to the Rose Bowl section and read, read the letter that Forrest Bim had wrote with me. And, and those are very inspirational letters. Then we go into uh, uh, the 1996 season, another very good uh, season, close to another national title, and then the last season we enter in this display is the 1997 season. And once again, this was a season that was a tremendously wonderful season. Uh, one of the highlights of that season was that game against Missouri where we had to come back in a miracle win and, 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 and win against the Tigers down there. But the thing that was really a sad day was the day that uh, Osborne, at the end of the season, announced that it was over. I think it was uh, there's been speculations about why he did that. Tom Osborne was not done coaching. I mean, he, he could have coached for another 10 years easy. Uh, yes, health was a little bit of a concern. But what I believe is the main motivation is the fact that uh, several years earlier, he had made a promise to Frank Solich. And Frank Solich had been offered the head or uh, the assistant head coaching job at the University of Notre Dame. And he was going to accept the job. And Tom Osborne went to him and said, We don't want you to leave, we want you to stay. And Frank said, Yeah, but it's, it's an opportunity that I have to have. And Tom says, Stay, uh, I'm only going to coach seven or eight more years, and then, and then the job yours. And actually, that was 10 years past. And so finally, he felt that he had to live up to his agreement. And that just once again shows you the great man that Tom Osborne is. I mean, rather than have the glory and the position and something he loved, to me a promise was more important to him than in a position. 
One of my favorite pieces in the whole display is this one right here. This is Tom Osborne's last sideline pass at his last game at Memorial Stadium. He still had two more games. Uh, he had the Big 12 Championship in 97, and he also had the, 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 the game against um, uh, Tennessee in the Orange Bowl. But this was his last ever game at Memorial Stadium. And this is the pass that he won the sideline. Take a look at the back, because the back it has his personal notes. And take a look at the very last thing that he wrote on that sideline pass. And more than anything else, I'll tell you the type of person that I'm on for this. How did you happen to get that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was uh, thrown into the trash can after the game. You're kidding. And, and I had a, a friend who uh, works for the university who dug it out of the trash can. I never thought you would have kept it. You really kept it in the excitement. When, 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 uh, when we decided to put this uh, display on exhibit, we wanted to begin with the Osborne era. Not that I want to take anything away from Frank Solich, but my personal opinion is, is that the Frank Solich era is in its infancy and its history in the making. And now is not the time to sit and reflect upon what Frank Solich has done. Now is the time to support Frank Solich and continue to support the program. The Osborne era is over with and it's been a glorious era. And um, people often ask me, why did you put this uh, collection on exhibit? And there's four reasons why. The first reason why we did is because um, we wanted to help the museum. To me, this is a wonderful museum. Uh, it's one of the great architectural uh, buildings in the state of Nebraska. It's considered one of the four great Art Deco architectural buildings in the entire United States. And to me, to preserve a building like this, it's wonderful not only for the city of Omaha, but it's wonderful for the state of Nebraska. So if we, in some way, can help the museum, we felt that, that we should. Many people have helped me build this collection over the years, friends and, and players and coaches, and for me to, to put it on exhibit is simply paying back what a lot of people have, have, uh, have helped me accomplish. Um, the second reason we put it on display is to help people understand the history of Nebraska football. I think there's a lot of people who have no knowledge of the early history and still love the program today and understand it. But I also think that the more people understand the history, the more they appreciate the program today and maybe have a deeper understanding of the program today. So if people understand the history, that's, that's a good thing. The third reason that we put it on display is because we do plan to open up a restaurant and uh, someday, I think, if people have seen the collection here and we open the restaurant at Bay Job of Memories, and they'll decide to come into the restaurant. And the fourth reason we put it on display is because this collection is something that we want to continue to grow. I especially like to add vintage pieces. And if people can see that we're approaching this from a historical standpoint, then maybe some people would feel comfortable selling me some pieces that normally they wouldn't want to sell. Some people don't want to sell because of money. So to some people, it's not money. To some people, it's that, that if they have a wonderful piece from an uncle or brother, uh, a grandfather who played for the university, they want to know that it's going to go to a place that's going to be protected and a place where fans for years to come can see it. So that, those are the reasons we put it on. And I'm sorry I'm long-winded. I'm sorry I took too much of your time. But I appreciate you coming. And tell all your friends to come out and support the museum because this is a wonderful place for Omaha and the state of Nebraska. Thank you. What is this insured for? Uh, the collection? Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's insured, but, but I, I hate to give it to you. Okay, yeah. It's price was so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Would you, you say that the uh, O Street Gang's influence is less than it was years ago? Very much so. Very, very much. So number one, that there's hardly any viable business to have in those groups. And uh, the, the, the way of doing business is spread out so much. And also, no longer is the team so controlled by the uh, team. The team is really a state team today. And uh, it's interesting to note that only uh, only about a third of the season ticket holders live in Lincoln. A third live in Omaha, and a third live outside of Lincoln, Omaha. Mm -hmm. And uh, and about 17% of the season ticket holders don't even live in Nebraska. So so you know it's a situation where where uh, 
the, the real power now is not so much a group of businessmen sitting among them, right? and, and, and the alumni who, who are able to, to support them. Um, that's, and, and that's the way it should be. Um, we, as an alumni base, should, should put our trust in the athletic director and uh, the head coach. And, uh, and I'm not saying we should never complain, but, but we, we need to let them know the coach and we need to support them the way we can. They're not going to win every game. They're not going to win a title every year. But as long as we can keep the program viable and strong, that's what's going to happen. It's really a fabulous collection. Oh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Scott Frost was in that sense. David Ryder, who was not injured, but it's just that on the